Hello, and welcome to episode 175 of Dissident Waves. My name is Hello. Dominic. That's Ritz. And Trix is uh, not here at the moment. She may come online, we she do. may not. Who can say? But, you know what we do have? Albums. We have many albums to talk about. This is an episode we've been kind of concocting a little bit behind the scenes. I want to say for a couple mm. months now, roughly. Yeah, there were there were some kind of bigger plans of it, and you know, as with most plans, you have just ever and like it fell apart a, a bit, but we still got the bones of the uh, of the idea. Yeah, and this kind of turned into episode one seventy five, which is a milestone of its own. So you yeah. know, appropriate one maybe. Fr- one three quarters. Yeah, I have picked the latest in our radio headed muse journey. We'll say. It's the King of Limbs, and a bunch of singles from throughout Radiohead's discography, and Muse's Simulation Theory, the super deluxe version, which has a bunch of alternate tracks. Uh, Trix chose uh, Stephen Wilson's Grace for Drowning, which was uh, recorded at the same time as the other album she chose, Cenotaph by Bass Communion, another side project of Stephen Wilson. And Ritz, you chose Death of a Rabbit by Your Arms Are My Cocoon. You are the... Which is not... Yeah, it's not what I originally chose, but yeah. I, it, it, it kind of came out, it, it got announced and came out during, like, after we had originally planned this episode and before we we started recording. Yes. In that so it was, it was kind of a, it was kind of a, we kind of do have to cover this album for many reasons anyway, and... With, with the original plans uh, kind of falling through in this episode, I felt it was a bit easier to kind of just change the pick on this and get it on and do that. Yeah. Uh, to spoil this the next week, I was originally going to pick a, a more post-punky album, not an emo album. Uh, but yeah, that's that's uh, that's what's happened on this. And you might think that's a good segue to get into your arms, but I don't want to talk about that first. I want to talk about news first. I was going to say... Uh, your pick was always kind of the outlier because it was supposed to be more examination of Radiohead, Muse, and kind of how Porcupine Tree and Stephen Wilson fit into that equation. Yes. Yeah. Tricks his whole thing is, well, I didn't get into either one really. I got into Porcupine Tree, and that's like a similar yeah. thing but different. Yeah. One day she'll be able to expose his opinions and be more in depth, but that is not right now. You want to talk about Muse first? I want to talk about Simulation Tree first. I think it's a, it's becoming now. A bit of a trend to talk about Muse first. Uh, usually it's to rip the Band-Aid off. Uh, <laughs> this one's not as bad as Drones to, no. to rip the Band-Aid off. Drones was a... In a sake, it, it, it's, its downside wasn't just how mediocre the album was. It was having all the context of Muse, growing up with Muse, and being as disappointed as it was. So I, I guess going into simulation theory, which I never properly listened to. I'm going to check my last FM stats now. See if I did ever actually listen to the um to the album, I, I guess in proper. I bought this album when it came out in the hopes that you know it'd be returned to form. I have a version of it. It's not the same version that we listened to actually. It's like, oh, what is it called? The just I think it's just called the deluxe edition. Mm. So it it's missing like five of the alternative tracks, but it's got yep, so... like five of them still. So I've just taken a look at my last FM stats because I'm like, did I ever actually just put this album on in, in 2017 in the background and I've forgotten? But uh, no, this would have been when I was recording basically everything I was listening to. So this is pretty pretty fair to say if I listened to it or not. No, this was my first time ever listening to this album in full. I, was, I had listened to the singles before, uh, Fort Contagion and Dig Down. I was very... Oh, and Something Human, apparently, I uh, listened to. I, I, I was very unimpressed by the singles. I didn't think there was any interesting sound to go with, and there was a lot of fucking other music coming out in 2017. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 we have we had Malieri, we had now. Jungle yeah, Jungle. Right. Uh, simulation for you. was it 2018? Yes. The singles, the, Dig Down was from 2017 as a single. Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, for some reason, I thought the actual album itself was 2017. Now, that's, either way, 2018 still had some fucking good albums out there. Red Brockhampton album, I, I still love that DMA's one that we covered recently, MGMT. You know, those were it, it, even MGMT is an artist that's been around for quite a long time that was still putting out interesting music. Mm-hmm. So put that into it. So yeah, I guess 
this is going in blinds, not talking about any nostalgia. This is probably the most fairest I can go into a Muse album because there is no previous bias outside of I didn't like the singles when I heard them, so I didn't bother listening to the album. Yeah, and to set up my side real quick, like I said, I bought it. I bought a version of it. I remember being upset that they were going for the aesthetic they were going for because they're doing like a Stranger Things kind of 80s throwback kind of thing. Mm. And I, A, I was like, oh, that's so boring. Why are you just doing the popular thing? B, I was also like, I feel like they've already done this. And now that we've listened all the way up to now, they, they haven't. But like... All the electronics that they were experimenting with on, like, drones and um, the one before it. Names escape me right now. Um, second Law. Oh, the yeah, Second Law, yeah. I, I, I feel like it was ground well covered. N- now I feel a little bit differently about it. I'm more okay with it. But at the time I was like, why are you doing this? What the fuck? So, I think, I think the way to kind of describe this album is... It's boringly safe. It's yeah. not as disappointingly safe as, as Drones, which was a case of that doesn't even have the identity of Muse. This does have that, uh, that identity Muse brought up. The problem was is that it, it, it doesn't have the same identity that an album like Absolution or even Resistance would have, or even Second Law. It, it, it's what you've come to expect from it, it, it's what probably drones should have been if they were going to put out a safe muse album. It's it's like a roller coaster, you know. And we had like the big build up. We had all the albums, you know, amping up the tension, amping up the tension. Second law, more or less, is like the break and like the zigzag downward. And then drones is like that big downward, just careening to the bottom. And now well, we're cruising after the drop to whatever's coming next, right? And this is that cruise, that like moment of like, all right, we're here. I'll, I'll put it this way, just so you know, I'm not going to talk about the future of Muse uh, from here because I don't really know too much because I haven't listened to it it's so much new stuff. But I'm just talking about it now uh, as kind of having all this context and now listening uh, to these albums. I feel like if Drones came out after this album and said it the way that it was, Drones would have been less of a disappointment because they would have gradually devolved instead of completely devolved and then gone back to where they were. Because Second Law, despite its faults, it, it, its biggest positive was that they were still trying something. It, it was quite different to all the other Muse albums. Whilst Drones, in a sense, is different to the Muse albums, but it's not different to any other fucking stadium rock album out there. Right. It, 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 it lacks even having Muse's identity. Whilst this is a Muse album, but its biggest fucking problem is that it's boring. Like, there are, there are some decent songs here. I think there are some interesting moments, some decent songs. Or at least, you know, catchy. There's stuff that's catchy, and nothing on Drones was catchy. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, like the way propaganda does the thing. Like, propaganda. Like, that's at least something. Yeah, but you, you can go back to Madness, which has the exact fucking stuff in it. Uh, exact same start of so it's not it's not like you know you have an absolute point when you're saying like this is ground that they've covered before because in a sense it is you know it's not it's not like this is the exact same as one of their previous albums but the thing is is that those previous albums that you feel like it's covered ground on is because those have that more distinct identity, not just as a Muse album, but as an album in general. Yeah, it, it's it's not so much that Muse has covered this ground; it's that this ground has already been covered, and Muse has no reason to go back to it. They, they were cutting edge to a point, and now this is them. It feels like they're playing catch up to a trend for some reason. Yeah, yeah. Like again, it's this is season three of Stranger Things at this point, maybe or something like that. Mm. 2016, 2018, May, I think. I think season one was 2016, wasn't it? So this is pretty Maybe. Good. Two. Something like that. Yeah. Maybe this is between two and three. I don't remember exactly. But it, it was very uh, much the zeitgeist of, like, oh, man, 80s and synth pop. Like, Kavinsky was already out doing their thing. Like, Justice yeah. was already past that point in their thing. Mm. 
And now you have Muse coming in, being like, all right, it is time to do some synth pop. And uh, on some other stuff. You know, that, that's one nice thing, is they still have a lot of different sounds, despite the overall theming. Yeah. It, it, it's in the sense of, the things that you hate about drones, well, there is kind of a bit of, it, 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 this is a better album than drones, because it fixes a, a, a lot of that. Drones is such a... I don't know that's the one that we're comparing it to, which kind of sucks. You should be comparing any Muse album to that good stuff, but it, it, it's just, it's just not. I, I wouldn't compare this to a Black Holes. I wouldn't. It doesn't feel I wouldn't like even, the same. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even really compare this to Showbiz. It, it, it's comparable to Drones because that's what they're um, they're coming from here, and yeah, it, it, it's more varied. It is less uninspired. Like at least, even if what they are inspired by doesn't it doesn't lend any help to this album actually finding itself at least it sounds like it had some inspiration yeah like you got that like the 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 other part of propaganda is like this acoustic i want to say it, it feels like the breaking bad theme in a way where it's got and that like I, really twangy I, guitar i i think the the part of this album though that does have the most identity out of all this is just the reimagining aspect of it because when this has that compil, when it turns into the deluxe version, and we get the um, the compilation of them doing the album again in different ways, you know, sometimes you get the bog standard acoustic track of it, but at least hearing different variations on it, and then thinking that there's different ways to do their songs, at, at least that's kind of interesting to hear about, I guess, or at least interesting to try. At least it, it it doesn't feel like they've just added in a you know a shitty remix at the end of it. Right. That someone else has done to to put on a club that no one will ever actually remember in ten years. At least it seems like there's some effort in redoing these songs, which I admire. It, you know, it's like it's like it's the upside down. It's the alternate reality of what it could yeah. be. You know, and I do appreciate them willing to step step back from. It has to be stadium. It has to be epic. It has to be big. A lot of this yeah, is I, more toned down. I I don't like pressure building in the um in the studio one. It, it's such a just. Like, it's it's, it's cheesy. And, yeah, it's cheesy in the wrong ways, but yeah, I I like I like the reimagining it with the whole orchestra and stuff like that because the it feels like band. it double. <laughs> well, yeah, the marching band, but it feels like it doubles down on it, and when it doubles down, it's at least funner. Like if you take it a lot less seriously, you get a lot more enjoyment from that track. Oh yeah, like I think doing dig down as like a gospel version is an interesting take. Yeah. It definitely lends itself well to having that choral element, though I kind of wish the mix had b- boosted it more. Yeah, and again, the studio version that's on the actual main album is kind of just incredibly boring. But hearing it in that alternate version, it's like this is kind of a better, a better take on it. I mean, in the end, this album probably could have been a better compilation of songs than it was an album, which in a sense means it's failed as an album. But I, I mean, we're never that high on this to begin with, anyway. So. Yeah, it's somehow the, oh, wouldn't this be cool if it was like this? It's like, yes, it would. Why don't you just do that? Yeah. Like, the even, like, the one remix they have by Sam DeJong, like, it's cool. I like it. It works for what it is. I mean, I fully expected listening to this album in full to just go, I hated this, I hated this, I hated this. But (laughs) in the end, I was really indifferent. It just kind of exists. Like... I, I, if you if you told me to give a rating, it would probably be a five. That's how I feel. I feel like it's it exists. Maybe it would be lower just because it's kind of forgettable at points, but it's it's not that bad. It's just I'd probably give it like a six because it you know <laughs> a lot of like what you're saying is I agree with. I just think for what it is, if you take away the context of everything else that came before it, yeah, it it has some fun moments and fun songs, and that's fine. Right, that's that's totally acceptable. It's not Muse in the way that Muse was, but like, it works okay. <clears throat> See, and this is this is the thing now bringing onto that context as well is you can always you can always like ask people where you think the downfall of Muse starts, and depending on the person, you can get a different starting point. Some people believe it's Second Law. I think that's probably one of the more common ones to believe. Some people will say it's, it's drones, usually because they are second law defenders, and to me that is kind of where I um 
I stand on. I, I, I think the first true, like, bad album was uh, Jones, while second more. It's not a bad one. It's just very... It's very mixed. You can't call it average, because average yeah. just assumes it's kind of mediocre the whole way. It's a very mixed album. Um, this is average. Whilst some, some people would also say Resistance is also the start of their downfall. And in, into a, a very light sense, that is true, because that is where they start to go stadium rock. I feel like this, this is the album, though, that's kind of cemented that the downfall was real. They're never going back because, to what they were. Yeah, because... This is kind of, in a sense of what is probably the best album of the tens that we have covered as an album, and in, in its consistency, it's uh, probably Simulation Theory. What is the actual best album put aside the consistency of the tens? Second Law. Yes. Yeah. No. Second Law is a very inconsistent album. That's what I I mean by that. But as an actual consistent album, it's technically it's technically Simulation Theory is the best out of that. Which is sad, because it, it really is just kind of like... Like I said, I bought this in 2018. I have not yep. listened to it since 2018, I'm going to bet. Mm. It was fine. It, it did its job. It was acceptable to listen to at work. But like, if you talk about what's the best uh, album of the naughty, so that's you know the rest of the discography, basically, to this point. And that's a huge actual like discussion to be made there. Oh, yeah. You know, or, Origin of Symmetry, Absolution... Black Holes and Revelations and Resistance, you could probably go to anybody and they, they you know, Resistance would probably get the least out of all those as the answer, but it would still get a, a, its fair share of defenders saying it's the best album. Whilst here, I mean, it's... The answer is probably Simulation Theory. I mean, you, I, I think the actual answer is Second Law. I think but, the answer is Second Law. I mean, I, 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 I yeah. liked it more than you did, but... Yeah, or well, I, I think Second Law is better than this album. Yes. It's just talking about it. But that's kind of the thing is that if you probably took any album from the tens for that music did and compared it to the worst of it beforehand, you pick you pick the, the album beforehand. I mean, maybe Showbiz you could argue is worse than second. I, I say I maybe you could argue Showbiz is worse than second law at a certain point. But maybe, yeah. You know, from Origin of Symmetry to Absolution all of them are better than the um, the best album that they did in the tens. And if Second Law was definitively the worst album that they had put out uh, in the tens, then maybe there were, you could say that there, there wasn't a downfall. But yeah, we, 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 their best album of the tens is something that's either really mixed or really average. It, it, it's they're a shell of just the quality that they used to be. Yeah, and that's what I mean by this has cemented the downfall is that it, at this point they had gone a decade without putting out a, a a great album. And it's the weird thing of I I don't know what it is about bands that change and get to this point. I feel like there's been a number of bands that just go the stadium rock route or just have that in their repertoire and that's what they do now. Mm. And you know, bands can't be great forever, but. You, you you still feel like there will be bands that put out a sudden good album every once in a while. I mean, the Death Cab for Cootie album that came out um, a couple of years back was surprisingly really good. Yeah, that's all Yeah, yeah, we did that one. Yeah, well, like, yeah, it was just one of my favorite albums of the year, of one of my top twenty yeah. of that year because I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought it was going to. So it's not like it's impossible for these types of artists to do this, uh, to to keep up the quality. But yeah, but, we yeah. still got some more music to go, and that's gonna. That's going to be fun to talk about, because I, I know some of the uh, complaints of that album, and there's a bit of a, what the fuck did you just choose we got, we got a We got a couple sidetracks before we get there. Yes, yeah. Because there, a lot happened between this one and the last album that came out, for some reason. <laughs> mm. But, you look at a band like Green Day, and Saviors was better, I think, than a lot of their more recent output. Revolution Radio was also fine. It was good. Mm. But, there is this respondency to just go to what's more mass appealing or what the image of the band is, the image of the artist, instead of focusing on making good music. Is that just because they have success now? They have money now? It doesn't matter? They're just not hungry? Who can say? But there, there is that disappointment factor of, all right, I'm supporting this band, I'm supporting this band, I'm supporting this band, I like this band, I like this band, I want, I want people to love this band. 
then everyone loves the band. And then they like lose the things that you care about that made you so interested. Mm. And this is like not I don't know if this is peak muse at that point of yeah, they're just doing something else now and it's all just it's the same kind of demographic that likes Imagine Dragons in a sense. I do think they're better than what yes. Imagine Dragons puts out, but No, no I I get what you mean by that. Maybe they're the ones that just show up the concerts, who knows? I mean they ain't cheap tickets anymore. Oh, God no. I don't even think I could call this a blender or a cheese sandwich. I I don't really have any favorites to pick from it, but I don't really have any least favorites. It's not because it's a blender. It's not because it's a cheese sandwich. It's just because this album really only exists for me now to kind of just be talking it for the rest of Muse's discography. I don't think I'm ever going to talk about this one again. I mean, the favorite, I guess if I'm going to have to say what the favorite is, it's the fact that they reimagined some of these tracks because they're better than the original versions, but in the end, yeah. If we're going by the original album, Dark Side's probably the best song on there, although I do like Algorithm and The Void, beginning and end, kind of like sounding similar enough that in having that synth vibe, that's always fun at least. But realistically, it's the reimaginings. You know, it's the pressure UCLA Bruin marching band thing. It's when they do the gospel version of Dig Down. Those are fun. Those are interesting. And that's what this album is kind of lacking is that like impressive quality or that interesting quality. Mm. It's all good, but yeah, it's not a cheese sandwich. It's not a blender, but it's still, it's a third thing in a sense. Yeah, it just it's a simulation theory. <laughs> that's, that's our new metric. <laughs> what do you want to move on to? I think we're going to do Radiohead, don't we? Yeah, we're right here. Might as well. The King of Limbs. But this was a contentious album, wasn't it? It's arguably, in a way, not saying they're exactly the same, but it is kind of their drones. In a sense, yeah. It was um, very mixed from the Radiohead fan base and kind of still is to this day. Yes. Uh, some people consider it the worst Radiohead album. Some consider Papa Honey. I think they're a bit too harsh in this album. I, mean, I guess in Radiohead's discography, in a sense, you could say so, but yeah, it's, it's fine. It, it's still got some interesting moments that are done on it, but yeah, they are kind of done, I guess, more interestingly on stuff like In Rainbows or, uh, or hell, even the Benz, you'd feel like, has, has done some of the stuff a bit more interestingly. I might okay, take this over Pablo okay. Honey, but that's... I'd probably, kinda... yeah, I'd pr- probably where I'm at as well. It's, it's, it's an okay. album... It, it, you know, it, it expands upon their idea of like doing more electronic and kind of cutting things up. And using a lot of programming to make music, not just like playing songs and making choruses and doing rock. Some mm. of that's there a little bit, but it's the experimental stuff. And I don't know, it's it's cool that they're doing it more. It's cool that they're taking some of what Tom York was doing by himself and like putting it back in. Oh, I gotta do the uh the quick comparison now that I've been doing this whole time is the uh it's the Honest one hundred results. Mm-hmm. And um Muse simulation theory, I can tell you, had zero songs in the whole two hundred. That's impressive. Uh, and was not in the album's poll. So Triple J listeners had basically given up on Muse by this point. Uh, since then, Muse has not hit the hottest 100 cents. I will say or that. Or the 200. Or the 200. Psycho uh, was the last time they had hit the 200 at all. Simulation Theory did get to number 7 on the ARIA charts. Yes, yes. The ARIA charts were still there. Radiohead, however, had hit 13 on the album's poll. I said there was still enough love to vote for this album in the album's poll, even though it didn't make the 10. I think this might have been their first one to not make the 10, but I'll have to, like, double-check that. Yeah. Uh, And Lotus Flower made number 61. So, still made the 100. Since this album, they have... I'm I'm basically wrapping this up with the hottest 100 results here, because now that we know Muse doesn't have any more, there's not much reason to do comparisons. There's only one more to do Yes, it's it's a moon-shaped pool. And a moon-shaped pool made number 8 in the album's fall in 2016, and Burn the Witch made number 80 or so in the, in the Hottest 100 in Countdown. So yeah, that's kind of where that ends. I think, I think Radiohead did make another 200 with like Spectre or something like that. So they I had, some, yeah, had some success with that as well, interestingly enough. But yeah, at this point in their career, Radiohead has won that fight. Yeah. So the one's still standing. And I, and I think 
at the very least, even if you don't like King of Limbs, you can at least appreciate it as an experiment. Especially because mm. they were very good about releasing a lot of remixes and things. Yeah. So it, it, it at least had, I think, had the sense of, this is an era. It's not going to be forever. Mm. Because at that point, they had very much established that, like, post Hail to the Thief, they were not interested in doing traditional, like, Kind of like Muse, they were not interested in doing the traditional, you know, build up of quality and like just improve over the last, improve over the last. They already hit their peak. Now they're doing something else. Mm. I do think it's interesting that it's really when the album gets to like the middle part where I find myself getting really interested by what's going on. It's like Lotus Flower and Codex are kind of the more traditional songs of the bunch, where there's at least you know lyrics that are like sung in a way that's you know oh yeah i I do like tom york singing and things like that like the more not classic radiohead stuff but things that fans can easier latch on to but i do like feral as well because feral has this very skittery like i don't know if you've ever played the game res but it feels like a Uh, level in res no i don't think I've, I've, i've ever played res very abstract rail shooter made in like 2001 or two so it's very of the like y2k aesthetic and yeah it's very Mm. synesthetic in that you press a button it makes a sound and everything is kind of sequenced to the bpm and like the 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 sound font and language of the song that's playing so it all kind of coalesces as you're playing the game it's you know by the same people that made like luminous and tetris effect and all that stuff but feral kind of sounds like what that soundtrack is doing with like a lot of the kind of different noises and little spurts here and there that you kind of hear so i i I like it for that specifically but beyond those three tracks there really isn't much for me to grab onto yeah i mean that's kind of the comparison i guess you can do to simulation theory is that in the end this album kind of just exists yeah and this is where i got on with muse this is or sorry, Radiohead. This is the point in which I started listening, and so I remember being like, oh, I'm not as into this, but I will do. I will look at all the other stuff more gladly. And there were some songs on the remixes that I did like, so I kind of, you know, checked those out a little bit more, but this is definitely the like, oh, yeah, this also exists, doesn't it? Hmm. I mean, the, in the end, I think the most interesting part of the solo Radiohead era, I guess, that we're covering at this point, was the uh, the B sides and specifically, it, it, it's I guess something that doesn't exist from the King of Limbs time, but it's what you've added onto here. Yeah, uh, is Pop is, is Pop is dead, which I think is also considered to be one of Radiohead's worst songs. Yeah, it's not on streaming. I wonder why. Yeah, <laughs> it's um, it's not that bad of a song, but as a Radiohead song. Yeah, and that's I guess that's what you're gonna compare it with King of Limbs for. It's like it's not the fact that these songs are bad, because you compare it to just so many other artists out there that exist and their best work, and you could mm-hmm. you could still pick this over it. It's it's the fact that it's not Radiohead standards. You know, it might be Pablo Honey standards, but it's not the Radiohead standards. And I'm not like quite sure when song. when it got released. When did Popper's Day get released? I didn't actually check that out. I think like ninety four, ninety five, but we can double check. Yeah, it was okay. It was released in 1993. It was a non-album single as well. So, yeah, and, and the actual members of Radiohead have have said they regret releasing the song. I don't think it's that bad. I really don't think it is. Mm. It's kind of cute. I, I, it's very disposable, but it's not bad. In, in these times, if it was on a B-side compilation and it was released for that, you would definitely uh, probably not have gotten it. But I think it's the fact that it was a single. And it's turned into a non-album single, but, it, you know, it could have potentially been the lead-up to an album or something like that, and it could have had bigger plans. Sure. I mean, this was the follow-up to Creep, if you want to if you want to look at it in that yeah. way. Mm. So maybe, you know, compared to what Creep was doing, especially, this was not maybe the, the, the move, right? But I, like, I included basically eight songs from Pop is Dead up until 2011 when The King of Limbs came out, because, you know, the Simulation Theory album had double tracks, so why not yeah. extend what is otherwise it, yeah, it's, a yeah, short album? A good time. A good time to consider some of the uh, the extra moments in Radiohead's discography. Like, half of these are from 2011, with you know, the King of Limbs also being there. Super Collider, The Butcher, Daily Mail, Staircase, all kind mm. of coming in that same year. So I, there was still signs of, like, hey, 
If you like quote unquote regular Radiohead, they also still exist. But I am. Um... There's a couple uh, you, can, you can go first. Like, I Want None of This is from a, a compilation that... Oh, what is it? I had this whole thing I was going to say. Help, with a, help, A Day in the Life. It was like a... Mm. The Help album was like in the 90s. They put um, Lucky on there from OK Computer before it was on OK Computer. So Help, A Day in the Life was the sequel album for like you know, AIDS relief. And uh, actually this one was for Bosnia and Herzegovina help the uh, war effort that or like you know for humanitarian reasons there so i want none of this was that song for that album but i'm like lucky that never got released anywhere else and you know i i don't think it's very memorable or super standout but it's something yeah there isn't much um standout just in i guess i mean <laughs> ironically pop is dead is the most standout of all this but because of how different it is immediately this was a very I guess, simulation theory error of Radiohead. It's all really <laughs> just coasting on. It's fine, but... Mm. No, I, I don't know about that. I, I think there was more divisiveness yeah. towards King of Limbs. And then there was the simulation... If, if simulation theory had come out before drones, there would have been that divisiveness, but at this point, you know, I think people had, had basically given up on these. Sure. Yeah. You know, you go from In Rainbows to, to King of Limbs, that is a, a complete, a complete shock. Yeah, really, because In Rainbows is considered up there with the best of Radiohead's discography, and um, in King of Limbs is considered in the worst. Whilst we didn't go from, we didn't go from Absolution to Drones. We went from Resistance to the Second Law, which Resistance, whilst up there, yeah, it, it's not as highly rated as, as an In Rainbows, comparatively. Right. And we went from that to Second Law, which Second Law was very mixed, but it wasn't average like the kind of King of Limbs is. It was mixed. So there's a lo- I reckon there's a lot more people out there that's defending the Second Law than there is defending the King of Limbs, comparatively oh, yeah. fan bases. And, you know, like, they're, they're very different fan bases, I would say, and so I feel like the, yeah. the uh, motivations are going to be different. But-, but going from Second Law to Drones is definitely not the same. No, yeah. Like I said, this is this is an era. It feels like a specific moment in Radiohead's discography versus Muse. It just becomes their discography. Yeah. Like, there's every, every idea that Radiohead could do something different or go back or do something else because they at least had that degree of maneuverability. But, no. Not for Muse. I have a very similar take, I guess, for my favorites and least favorites of this. I don't actually think there's anything strong to strongly I can say as a favorite or a least favorite. Uh, that's probably going to be me for most of this episode. Not going to lie, until <laughs> probably the most interesting album of the uh, of the bunch. But yeah, I mean, this is better than album simulation theory if we talk about it by albums. Uh, I don't know if it's better than simulation theory, honestly. I think I like simulation theory more than King of Limbs. Interesting. Because while I do like three of the songs on King of Limbs, I think the other ones are relatively boring or just non-factors for me. Whereas, as you said, Simulation Theory is at least consistent. Uh, okay, I guess that's fair. Um, if you have a favorite or a least favorite, I guess, uh, if you want to move on. Barrel, Lotus Flower, Codex, those are all three of my, those are like, those are my th- three favorites. That's, that's yeah. I do like uh, Daily Mail. From the B sides, I think that's a fun little song. Some of the other ones are kind of interesting. Pop is dead, like you said, but yeah, that's kind of where we are. Now, um, let's uh, let's bully tricks. <laughs> okay, if you want to bully tricks, then we start with bass communion. Uh, over an hour of Stephen Wilson doing ambient tracks that are just twenty minutes each of nothing. Yeah. I um, I can I can dig I can get down with some ambient stuff, uh I can get down with some weird stuff. This is like just leaving your guitar on. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna stay silent for twenty minutes. <laughs> oh, uh, the other yeah. thing that's interesting about King of Limbs I forgot to mention is apparently it was recorded in Drew Barrymore's house. Part of it. <laughs> that's that's funny. That's... Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's all I have to say about bass communion. Cenotaph. 
Citadel, Carrion, Cenotaph, Conflux. Oh, so the, those this... are the track names. There's different lengths if you listen to it on, on LP versus CD. I know, I know, I know Chicks picked this because it was made at the same time as the other album, but this could have been an email. <laughs> That's my take. Yeah. Over to Stephen Wilson. I'm, 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 there's literally nothing else to talk about no. this album. It, there's no favorites or least favorites, nothing like that. That's not that kind of album. Yeah, but it's... it is my least favorite of the week. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, for my favorite. Grace Johnny. Week, really? Yes. I, I didn't care for this one either. I thought this was fantastic. I thought this was the thing where, like, he's unshackled from Porcupine Tree, he's unshackled from all the other artists, he can just do what he wants to do. And it's very much that stereotypical thing you imagine rock artists doing as a solo project where it's very complex and jazzy and weird. But I think it works. Maybe I just don't care for Stephen Wilson. But I just, I, I struggled to get into this one. I listened to it before Bass Communion, so I wasn't pissed off from Bass Communion. So just put that out there. This isn't a case of I wanted to kill Stephen Wilson before I listened to it. I, uh, I don't know. I can't say, like, this album's pretentious or anything. It's not like it's it's doing nothing compared to the actual pretentious one. But I can't say it's doing anything for me. I, it's just one of those things where I like what he's doing with the choral elements. I like what he's doing with the strings. I think his singing works really well. I, I mean, he's got songs. a good voice in this. I, 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 I'll agree on the vocal performance being pretty strong on this album. I think the songs, for you know, for the most part, earn their length. Raider Two being twenty three minutes is a lot, but other than that, I I really think that you know these songs when they when they come on, it's like oh, that was really good. It's kind of cheese sandwichy, and then like nothing super stands out. But I do, I mean, I do like Deform to Form a Star and that kind of section of the album. But it's it's one of those experiential ones where it's like that was really cool. I'm. I just didn't get any real experience from this from this album. That's that's all I can say. I mean, no, yeah, it, it definitely. It's not like this got lost in the source of this week. It definitely stands out in its own sound. I mean, it, it's it, it, it's prog rock. Yeah, it's, it's, there's no doubt about that. I, I don't think that's really getting too far away from what Porcu- uh, Porcupine Tree is. I wouldn't say this is as um as produced as some of the Porcupine Tree. No, that was because I think yeah. part of Pokemon Tree's problem is that it it is so produced and it is so yeah. out there that like when it's not as memorable as other things, you, you really kind of start to tune out. Where this for me kept my attention a lot more easily because it's like, oh, that sounded weird. That yeah, was no, interesting. I, I'm just trying to think how my listening experiences were compared to Pokemon Tree. I, I probably will tend to agree. I think this one probably kept my interest a bit more. I didn't have to take as many breaks. From it as Porcupine, as Porcupine Tree just got very, um, I guess, draining. Yeah, the first time we did Porcupine Tree, it was I think for both of us it was kind of a flat line. Yeah. And then we did it again, and I was like, okay, there's something to this, but not maybe not this album. This is yeah. the one where I'm like, okay, I can see the appeal of Stephen Wilson. I like this album, not Bass Commune, not not Cenotaph, but this one. Yeah. I don't know. It's just it's. It struggled to stick the whole way through. It, 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 a real out uh, in one ear, out the other type of uh, type of record for me. I, I I I could see the appeal, I guess, but it's it's just really yeah. Steve, uh, just don't care for Stephen Wilson's work. It's, it's just he's certainly prolific. You know that's ah uh, nice. definitely. There's so many projects he's involved in. Tricks can bring up so many things. Mm. But. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with you either. It is kind of in one ear out the other, but I also am like, is that just because of the way I listened to this album? Because I did it at the take breaks? Because Raider 2 is so long? But, yeah. Potentially, yeah. I I dug it, I, it, but I also can't, like, super defend it a ton, because it's not, like, it's not my favorite of the year or anything like that. I think I'm going to have more to say about uh, Death of a Rabbit. Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's the one I brought up for the, uh, for the Things to Say album. But it's cool. I will. I. That's just kind of where I am. It is cool. I like Grace for Drowning way more than I thought I would. Um, as I offend everybody with my favorites and least favorites this week, it's a blender. Sorry to say. I know. I know. It's not really. You know, twenty-three minute song. You can't say it's comparable to the uh, to the two minute intro in here. But when you get into in deep into this album, it, it's uh, 
it's a, it's not full of enough moments on uh, on this record for me to to kind of grab my attention and go, yes, this is uh, this is my favorite part or these many different things. It's in a sense pretty consistent, but if you call it a blender, I, I call it a cheese sandwich. Yeah. I'm like I'm looking at these titles again, like. Oh yeah, Index was cool. Track one was cool. No part of me. Deform, deform a star. Even like, cause I listened to the uh, deluxe edition, so Home and Negative and Fluid Tap were there too. I'm like, oh, those were fun too. I like those. I don't know. Very, very blanket cheese sandwich recommendation, I guess. Um, now time for the uh, for the important part of this week. <laughs> yeah, your arms make a coon came through. With their debut album. Yeah. No singles, just, just released it. I mean, Pretty their 70 songs have been out before. We know this. Yeah, well, not not officially on 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 streaming, but they, uh, they've had a couple songs uh, played live. Uh, Muffled Beneath the Sound of the Ocean uh, has been in a live set for the past year and a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we covered a couple of these songs in the uh, Colorful Failures in a demo format. Uh, Houston and Let's Get Married. Um, Houston is also in the expanded edition of the EP for the for yep, live version. So yep, that is also true on that as well. So it's it's not like every single part of this uh, of this album is brand new, despite it all being dumped at once. But it, it's definitely never been released in the for, in the kind of. Well, I don't think they've released a single song that has the production that any of these songs do. Uh, no, this is. This is by far the cleanest your arms on my cocoon have sounded production wise. And Except for the vocals. Yeah. And I think that the big thing to compare it to is is the EP. It's it's been around four years since the EP dropped. Mm-hmm. Uh and the album's come out and a lot has happened for your arms on my cocoon in that period. The the EP kind of blew up during the past couple of years. Not not to the standards of this as a TikTok hit or anything like that, but they are yeah, you know, one of the big names in the whole Scrams world right at the moment. That's yeah. I uh, looked that's... at the EP and said, "I can do that too." Yeah, it, it, it's basically the the internet all went uh, went crazy, and when we finally were allowed to go see the Scrams gig, the whole internet community met up at all of them. And um, from there, I I think the kind of whole evolution into your arms from my cocoon becoming a full band really really shows on this album because there is a lot a lot from the live sets that have kind of uh been taken into consideration it feels like into what the actual sound of this album is and i go back to something that you said before i had seen them live that they were one mm. of the best shows you saw this year yes and i fully agree mm. I, there, there was something about hearing that ep with a live band and properly produced it feels like that made it suddenly go now i get it yeah, I mean, I don't. I was always going to be keen to see it, uh, regardless. But that, that's that's the whole thing. And this, this album is the full band. It's the actual live instrumentation happening now. It's not that garage band uh, drumming that's happening. It's actual live drums. Yeah. Um, everything's not so muddled into the mix. It's a lot more clearer to hear all this instrumentation. To a sense, the big kind of I guess uh, challenge that comes with that as well is that that is what stood out. Your arms are my cocoon. Mm-hmm. is how demo the official release was because mm-hmm. it, 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 it didn't sound like anything that people would usually release or get that kind of popularity and I think so, to the benefit because I think a lot of bands have taken that on and made that their thing too yes and, and to a sense not only has this inspired uh, a lot of artists in the scram scenes for fifth wave but it's also kind of inspired artists in the kind of subgenres of it. I mean, I I would argue this is a, a major part in claustrophobia pop as well, just with how kind of muddled and, and noisy it gets. Yes. I wouldn't say it, it's the most important uh, thing out of there, but I would say it's still up up on there. It is definitely the inspiration of a lot of um, artists in that scene as well. Oh yeah, and, and never forget that Tyler Odom is claustrophobia, uh, claustrophobia pop coded as well, which I always think is just incredible. I mean, claustrophobia pop flows through this. Hex D has flown through your arms and my cocoon. Yes, yes, that is that is also true. They were, um, I, I believe the deluxe edition was released on Dismiss Yourself, which does a uh, bunch of Hex D as well. And the, you know, the the song I'm Ruined is the closest we've gotten so far to seeing them take on the genre. 
Yes. They're they are so they're so associated now with a lot of other bands and even Cybergrind stuff. Mm. Like they really like Yours My Cocoon has truly become like the nexus of everything. Mm. And it's kind of funny because you you would kind of think, well, it's gonna be the more produced stuff like Origami Angel, Home Is Where, but like and it, they do they do hold their own. And I mean, Home Is Where probably doesn't hold it as much as Origami Angel or Your Arms Are My Cocoon. But I do think when it comes to the best, best in there, and, and let's not say that B. McDonald uh, isn't in, important to oh, a lot of the other artists in the scene. She, totally. I mean, she, she, she's a hundred percent on this album. There's someone else doing the music. Yes. So. But it, but it, but it, actually, it, actually, people judging the music and what everyone talks around. I, I don't think Homer's Way gets that same kind of, I guess, talk around that maybe an Origami Angel does. Uh, I, does get what I was trying to say are. though is that they they all seem they're kind of forging their own paths, right? They like yes. they're, they're following those. All right, we got an album or two out. We've made some money. We got some better production values. We got Jack Shirley on this bitch. What are we doing? Mm. And I'm not saying that Your Mother My Cocoon isn't there or can't get there, but this still feels like a uh, hey, it's four or five years later. We're still doing you know the usual bar shows. We're still hopping around the world with our friends. It's a different vibe, mm. you know. I, 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 like it's not to say one is better than the other or that one is more valid than the other or anything like that. It's more of some of the bands have kind of spun out and have started like really making it out there in the in the traditional sense you would imagine bands do. But then there are other bands that are still making it that are doing it in a different way, like this. Mm. And this this album definitely does incorporate just a lot of these sounds that we've heard throughout. Uh, just every kind of subgenre or anything like that. I, I I wouldn't say, you know, this album becomes those subgenres, but you can definitely feel like this just just that influence that's come from either playing with these artists or learning about these artists and all that. Yeah. I mean it, there's it is the hardcore breakdown at City on Fire with all the chip tune happening into that. You could say that's probably the closest to Cybercrime this gets. But then you get other stuff like through the brighter eyes of Hazel that just sounds completely different to everything else that's happening. Yeah. Which it's one of the more chaotic songs on here that has a lot of switch ups that happens on it in such a fast period of time. Uh, the obvious cat in the bag when talking about this is Runner Duck, which starts off with screaming over a banjo. Yes, I. What a what a strong choice of an opening. Yeah, I, and that's another one that goes through all these different parts. I mean, this this isn't an album of choruses. Don't expect any yeah. choruses in here. This is, is an album of, of moments, and I think it builds up to these moments. They have some satisfying outros. I mean, this, the title track on here, which probably is one of the less screamy songs, apparently, of how long it is. And it's, it's still screamy, don't get me yeah. wrong. But that is such a soft, like a soft spoken indie track for like half of it. And there's other stuff like how Muffled Between the Sound of the Ocean becomes like a harmonica thing at the end. Mm. And that, that itself is so beautiful and impressive to me that I'm like, oh my god, they're really going for something on this one. And I, I love and appreciate how much, just compared to the EP, how much difference there is. Yeah, it, it's not just, okay, now we've got the production, let's make the EP again. It's, it's recognizing that that was a, a hindrance to, to the EP. Yeah. But it wasn't the next step. Like, the, like so, between the harmonica and the singing song that's on Runner Duck and a couple, I think a couple other tracks too. Yeah. The Home is Where influence, I think, is one of the stronger ones. Mm. And I think that that's taken a life of its own because there's an indie feel to this. Oops. Mm. Uh, there's an indie feel to this. There is something about it that gives it its own aesthetic that is not quite, you know, just scram, that's not quite just fifth wave emo. This feels like an autumn album. This feels like a neutral milk hotel, like adjacent album in some ways. Yeah, I mean, this is as I was saying. This this feels like fixing the problems and evolving at the same time. I don't think it's fixed every every problem. I think in some senses there are still some mixing or chaotic moments on it, which are still struggling to kind of hit at the moment if they are ever going to. But it, it's such an Im- impressive. I guess just increase in quality. Mm-hmm. Without they have like it, it's not just oh now we had the production let's make a standard Scrams album. It, it's realizing what the identity of uh, of your arms and Mike Coon sound is and still working with that. Yeah, 
it, it's proving for one that it wasn't just that it sounded shitty. There was actually something to the concepts in the EP. Because if, was... if go ahead, because if this did just sound like a, stand, a standard of scrams, I feared that would be what people would probably talk about and say like, oh, it only sounds interesting because of how crap the production uh, in chronology is because you know of obviously the restrictions. But it's the fact that it still sounds like that identity proves that it was that the poor production was just a hindrance that was happening in there, and there was some actual genius with that EP. Yeah. You know, that EP was born out of, this is what I got, this is how I have to make it right now. Yeah. This is, alright, I've got what I want now, or at least some of what I want, I don't, I can't speak for Tyler Odom. Let's, yeah. let's do it, like, for reals. Let's, let's blow these things out, give us the big hits, give us the, the like, just the contrasting moments on Let's Get Married Alone, mm. even compared to the demo. Oh my god. Mm. Did not expect that that's the song, that the direction that song would take. Because you listen to the demo and it's like a like a kind of just a nice little, almost like like lullaby and kind of like almost like he's singing to himself as he's falling asleep in a way. Yeah. And then this one gives you and, those hits. Mm. Right. And I, I think I think another part of like this kind of album that hits is the way that tracks transition with each other. It feels like it's actually flowing yes. properly and tracks are ordered in a specific way. I mean, one what one of the favorite moments on here is just literally the switch from City on Fire to Portraits. Yeah, that's seamless. You don't even know yeah. what's happening. Like they're two completely different tracks. And you could probably say, is this a different track? And, and it is, but it, it does make you second guess a little bit if you're not paying attention because it it it, it feels like they belong with each other, like at the certain a certain direction. And a lot of these tracks do. I you can't say that it means that every flow on this uh, album is successful. Sure, but. I can't also say that I would prefer track listing to be different in any order. I think it is done in the order it's supposed to be done. Even even between "Let's Get Married" and "Muffle Beneath the Sound of the Ocean," there's that quick drumstick hit cup like count off that still manages to sound like part of the flow and part of everything. Yeah, it, it just yeah, it all like that whole first half works really well where you get four songs that more or less flow into each other. You get the big standout moment with "Runner Duck." And then you get something else. Mm. It's a, and it's an album with surprises, an album with variety. And it's pretty long for a Scrams album. Yeah. Like, 43 minutes, you might go and say, oh, that's a pretty standard album length. And it is. Which is not what Scrams albums usually are. Uh, Blind Girls has got, like, a 26-minute album, I think, from this year. I'm going to go check that now. Uh, Ogbert the Nerd, I think there were, like, only 20 albums um, in 20 minutes. Uh, Captain Jazz, which was one of the longer ones, and that had a lot more ambience in it, was um, was 36 minutes. Uh, I'm just checking what the Blind Girls one the next that exists was. Yeah, that was 21 minutes, you know, which is pretty standard, I guess, for um, for those. I'm just trying to find a, a, another cool example I could probably um, could probably use here. I mean, there was a Postcard Nowhere either, uh, album even. Which was eleven minutes. I mean, I know it's more of an EP, but yeah, you know, it's not like the releases that we usually get from um, the emo scene have been uh, have been that long. I mean, you know, you get some uh, uh, some more, I guess, exemptions from that when you start to go into the more shoegazy part of it. I mean, Paranol and Asian Glow usually put out some pretty uh, pretty long records. That Oolong one, I guess, is also kind of a. Uh, Exemption as well, but it was more of a double album. The Whaler was also, you know, album length. Yep. I, but I think those that, ones, those ones, you feel like are less scramsy and still in a sense. I think this one is the most comparable to the Whaler and that you know, Home is where mm. it had the big EP, and then they turned around the album. That was in a way shorter time period, but. And uh, so I think technically I became birds. They consider an album. You're right. My bad. My mistake. But. Don't worry, I've made, I, I, I've made it my EP of the year, so I've made that mistake. Um, in a sense, one of the other things to kind of, I guess, compare it to uh, just when this this album kind of gets longer is the Doris album. And that's, a, that's another one that we listened to the uh, demos for. Yes. I think... I mean... with I just want to say with that one, I think I was less interested that we heard the demos first because the songs ended up sounding more very similar. Very similar, yes. Yes. This is one where I like that we listen to them first because it sounds so different. Yeah. So that's what yeah, you truly get out of it. The demos in the case where um, 
you know, the demos were great to listen to. And then by the time we got to the album, we had, you know, basically already heard heard the highlights from it, which I still defend Four Trees. I think uh, if we put away that context, it, it, it's an incredible Scrams album. And I, I just need to come back that, to it down the line, I think. Yeah, yeah. And that, that has a lot of slowcore influence, which this, this album, uh, you can't really say does. The, yeah. the Runner Duck, maybe you'd be able to say, but it, it's it's not a slowcore album. Which is, you know, you can't have every genre. <laughs> no. This, this, is, this is definitely more... I, I, uh, it, 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 it's quite fast-paced, despite having some long songs on it. But Ten-minute song, you know, six-minute yeah, song. The six-minute song is the slowest song on here. Uh, Runner Duck, yes, it starts off slow, but it really builds up to that kind of large, explosive outro. Whilst I know it does it with Death of a Rabbit, but that that uh, that isn't as like fast and chaotic in the sense that Runner Duck gets. I am disappointed we don't get Valentine's Day. I think that is a really good long song that they've done, but you know that was on the demos in both you know a demo form and a full form. I'm pretty sure or something like that. So mm. it was it did not seem destined for this, which is totally fine. Yeah, I think what we get here is still very interesting and still hits in a lot of interesting ways. Like, there, there's definitely some through lines, there's definitely some, like, thematic connections between, like, the... Like, the whole aesthetic of, like, cute animals, you know, run or duck, death of a rabbit. There's a, there's a cloying kind of sweetness and cuteness to a lot of what's going on, but also these really beautifully written lyrics. And there's all City on Fire, City in Ashes, you know, some of that stuff as well. And you contrast that with, like, the multiple sound of the ocean, you know, fire and water and all that stuff, too. There's a lot happening and constantly referring back to these nature elements. Swan dive, hot. It's, 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 it's a very, like, pleasant... Uh, you know, it, it, it definitely would have had a lot of hype, this album, uh, if it was announced a lot longer ago than it actually was between announcement and release. It was only kind of, like, 12 days basically i don't even think it was two weeks which honestly i think works to his advantage like, yeah if this had been an album that we'd heard a bunch of songs from and had known about for a while i don't know if it would be as much of a hit you know like, yeah it'd be like oh, okay we've heard this yeah yeah it, it's getting it's it's getting everything at once uh, you know we got that bit of context i guess anyway because we did listen to the demos and we we saw it live of muffled beneath the sound of the ocean being played live yeah so it's not like we are completely uh, completely lost in some of these songs as well, but it's it's knowing these songs, but not actually knowing what they would sound like on the full album means that there's those songs themselves, which are highlights. Right. I uh, still hit as hard as I do when we, when we get to listen to it, and this, despite that little that little period, this was a pretty hyped album for 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 everyone in the scram scene. Like the fact that when this got announced, like everybody that I follow that that um. Is he in the scam span or is in these scenes and tries to book shows? Just nonstop posting about it. I when, see when now it's announced, a lot of non- merch non- and vinyl stuff on there. A bunch. Yep. It, it, it's. I, I think. I, I can't remember which band uh, or label or something said it, but one described it as um, this is what Christians felt like when the New Testament dropped. <laughs> I mean, it definitely has that feeling of uh, it's finally happening. They did it. Yeah. But it's not the fact. It's not the fact that it's a new Your Arms on Michael Cohen. It's the first proper album. Yes. And they'd been known for so long and all that, and it's just it's just dropped. It, it, you know, yes, yes, it was twelve. Uh, it was twelve days of hype. It's not like it was a surprise drop in the end, but like less than two weeks is a very short time, especially in this day and age for an album rollout from announcement to um to that, or even from lead single because. Uh, you know, if they had a lead single, had an album rollout, even from last single to the album, it's usually a week. Yeah. And so, I, this isn't like if you look at the Bandcamp stuff, clearly, clearly was being worked on this whole time. Yeah. Clearly was in the works. You know, I think meeting all these people and having all these experiences in the intervening four years informed it and, you know, made this possible. Yeah, cause it's not like they were just touring in the U.S. as well. It's a fact that they've had the world tour this year. Yeah, it's it's not just been the Asia and Oceania to our shows. They played a bunch in Europe with um with Awake but Still in Bed quite recently as well. Afterwards, 
Like, reading so, the, like, the shout-outs section is just, like, a fucking murderous row of the important bands, or a lot of the important bands in the scene. In many I think it's one of the few times, I think we basically can recognize fucking every band that's shouted out in there. Let's see. Awake but still in bed. Awake but still in bed, yes. By the creation, yes. God, God fuck. fuck, we've covered, Injury. I'm pretty sure we've covered, I'm pretty sure we've covered at least one of each of those. We've covered at least a song uh, from each. Home is yep. where. Obviously. Hey, yeah, love you. you fly over states. Yeah. Yep, loves to fight. When, Widow, Dusk, and Catalyst, I don't think we, we have. In Loving Memory, um, we have not. Short, short fictions, fictions we, ha- we haven't sure. covered. Yes, I've listened to short fictions, haven't covered Homework, I guess not. Record Setter, do, we, we covered. Because they uh, did a thing split. with, um, they did a split. Yeah. Yeah. With Home is Where. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not literally everything, but it's, it, it's still like, there's kind of a lot of bands that are, and they're shouted out here, which. Yeah, you would expect some of the uh, members of these bands have contributed to this album in some some way or another. And like this, uh, this a bunch is of them have since, obviously been touring since Lobster Fight, you know, started kind of doing yeah. this, where it's like, oh yeah, they're all kind of helping each other out. It's a, uh, it, 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 it's kind of just a moment in time, I guess. This album now releasing, I reckon this will it be one of those moments that once the fifth wave and set is said and done, this. Whether or not this is the most important moment will always be uh, determined by the future. There's there's no point in claiming it when it can be beaten. But I think I think this is going to be one of the moments people talk about when they talk about the fifth wave. And I think there's been the fact that all this tour has happened to just a lot of countries that never expected to get any fifth wave like this. Yeah. It's kind of helped build up the hype for this as well. And it feels like there's a bit the community's very alive for this album. And that's kind of why I feel like this is a moment. It's not just because the album's good. It's the fact that the rollout, I feel, has been pretty fucking successful for this, even though it's theoretically been a 12-day rollout. I mean, this is definitely one of the big moments. I think Origami Angel Home is where releasing projects on the same day last year was a pretty big moment. Mm. And not to mention that, like, this is not the only thing that Tyler's put out this year. If you want to count Afraid of Crushes as EP, which, you know, we thought was fantastic. Yeah, it was, it was a very lovely, uh, simpler EP. It, was, it, it had some good tracks in there. It's it's nice to see artists kind of take bloom finally, you know, after all this mm-hmm. waiting and all this setup and, you know, adoration and everything else coming from all these different directions. It's like, ah, here they are finally coming out to the party. Mm. Not that they weren't there, but now that there's, like, a record to point to, I'm like, yes, they put it out. I, I just think that's huge. Mm. Uh, favorites off this, I know we, we probably actually talk more about the rollout than the albums at times, but it, it's a very chaotic album. You, you, you get as much as you can. Um, yeah. Muffled Beneath the Sound of the uh, the Ocean is a really good moment where this, um, where this album, you know, Let's Get Married is a good intro, but when you get that first kind of actual like proper hit into it, that's when you realize why exactly Let's Get Married exists. Yes. You know, not just for the lyrical content on the line, but actually as its placement in the album. That switch between City on Fire and Portraits is just that one of those moments where I go, holy crap, that just fucking hit hard. When the first kind of, like, explosion happens and run a duck, the da 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 kind of thing. It's just the way that the... It, it, it goes, and we get this full live instrumentation just after that whole banjo yes. opening. It's in a way, it's really like introducing. It's like the transition from just Tyler doing something alone, the full band yeah. coming in. Uh, the, cha- the chaoticness in Through the Brighter Eyes of Hazel, it, it, it's a very fucking chaotic and hard to kind of properly digest track, but it, it's one of those ones the more attention you pay to it, the more you realize how much it's doing, and it's it, it does stand out on its own. The personal favorite of this just has to be it's the standout in a way that I didn't expect it kind of to be. It is the title track Death of a Rabbit. Yeah. It it it, it really slows down what has been a very chaotic and fast scrams album and turns it into nearly an indie track despite that, you know, still having the your arms smacking cream flavor on it. The yeah. the outro to it is just incredibly fucking emotional and and, and satisfying. It, it it's it's paced perfectly in this album. It's it's the highlight of this, and you know it's easy to say run a duck. It could be it because it's a longer track and it has a lot of moments. But uh, someone 
someone wrote it uh wrote down in a comment when we were talking about it on release like is runner duck actually the best track or does it just have the most moments and i've and I feel that's how I feel about Runner Duck. I think it is a great track. It, ha- it is a great track because of how many moments it has. But if you actually ask what I think the best track is, I think like, just in as a full start to finish, it, it has to be the title track. Yeah. Least favorite, probably Moon Prince and Waning. I, I do like the way it kind of picks up again after Runner Duck, but I feel like it's something that's that was just already done on portraits. I pretty much agree with you. I think Let's Get Married and Muffled Beneath the Sounds of the Ocean really start strong. I love what Muffled Beneath the Sounds of the Ocean turns into. That harmonica part was really... Well, no, I mean, Let's Get Married has a bunch of hits, too, that made me like, oh my god. But that harmonica yeah. part was like, oh god. This is... There, there is something else happening here. And, mm. you know, kind of seeing how the album evolved from that into Robert Runner Duck... Moon Prince and Waning, I guess, is like my least favorite, but I also was listening to it again earlier, being like, oh, there's so much happening in instrumentation that I've not even like properly digested yet. Yeah, it's, it's, again, it's not like it's bad. It's just that yeah. I feel like it's it's something that's done kind of in itself already done by Portraits, even though Portraits is, um, yeah, you know, it's not like they're the same track, but, but I just like, feel like the kind of, it's placing in there is kind of already done. But I think Houston through Husk is also a really well-sequenced section. Where Swan Dive is really nice and beautiful. Death of a Rabbit is another huge highlight. Like it's, it's an album that is is more interesting than Grace from Drowning. But even then, I'm still like, I think musically Grace from Drowning is still better, right? I don't know. That's a disagree for me. I don't know. But um, what is your favorite track? Do you have a favorite track? Well, when it sounds the ocean. Fair enough. All right. Well, let's let's do the rankings for this week. Get it. Uh, get a. Th- Fun and done. I don't think mine will be too surprising. I'm not counting the B sides, no. really. I'm probably not even going to really count the deluxe thing, but I kind of am. Least favorite cenotaph, or cenotaph, however you pronounce it. Agree there. Uh, then, oh, yeah, it's it's going to get pretty pretty tough on this. But I think I I I kind of just don't really care for the, <laughs> the next three on this. Part of me wants to tie it, but it's not really true. I guess... <sighs> Fuck, that's hard. King of Limbs is better than two. I prefer King of Limbs to both Simulation Theory and, and Grace for Drowning. I think I probably prefer Simulation Theory to Grace for Drowning. Okay. Stephen Wilson fans, you can fight me later. Um, Favourite is, is, is Death of a Rabbit, but th- I mean, let's be realistic to this. This is always going to be my favourite from the start of this week. Just knowing yeah. that what we're going to cover. I th- least favorite Cenotaph. Then I'm going to put King of Limbs. Then Simulation Theory. And then Death of a Rabbit. And then Grace for Drowning. You know, this is this is one of those weeks where... Kind of like when we did um, I Became Birds. Where I think I, I think I put the Sufjan Stevens album above it. But like, you know, in my heart, Home is Where is still the more interesting album. Hmm. This is one of those weeks for me where it's like, I do think Grace or Johnny is the better album, but it's going to be Death of Rabbits, what I think about. Yeah. So, what are we doing next week? Well, we don't know what Trix is going to pick for next week, so we'll just we'll just hear about it when we hear about it. Um, I'll, I'll go with mine. I'm just doing the one album. This is the one that was originally going to be done this week, but I, I instead opted to pick the, the Your Arms on the Tomb for the reason that I said before. Uh, it's a new Yard Act album. We haven't covered Yard Act before. I have been listening to them uh, during this podcast and have had had them in a, um, in a Ritz 100 before, so there has been some love, but I haven't picked them before. And so it's probably time to, to make good on that and finally pick uh, finally pick them and see what uh, Dominic and Trick sing. So we're doing a new Yard Act album. Where's my Utopia? All right. And I said this in the chat. No one responded to it, so I just went ahead and stuck to it. We're doing more Radiohead and Muse. Um, Incredible. We need to. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna fucking put out the King of Limbs remixes. So that's the first thing we're gonna do. King of Limbs, or as it's called, TKOL remix. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Because it's the compilation of all the the remix singles. Mm. And then there's also Remix Eight that did not release in time to be on the album, but is still part of it. So that's Incredible. all going to be a thing. And we're now into the first Muse. As far as I know, the only big Muse spinoff project. The Jaded Hearts Club, which is not just a Muse spinoff project. 
it's also a super group of Jet, Blur, and Muse. <laughs> yeah, it's got Miles Kane from The Last Shadow Puppets, and Nick Chester from Jet, yes. Graham Coxon from Blur, Jamie Damus and Matt Bellamy from uh, Muse, and Sean Payne from The Zootons. That is a super group and a half that's randomly cut. It's mostly mostly English bands with randomly Jet. So we're going to do the live album because that, I guess, came first, Live at the 100 Club. Yes, I'm taking a look at the albums, and uh, well, according to uh, excuse me, according to Spotify, you've always been here as 2020, and the live one is 2021. But it's, it's it's up to you. I don't know which one's true. It, doing doing the studio album second will be better in the end. Yep. So I'm gonna just trust the Wikipedia dates, even though they're probably wrong. Yep. No, we'll that's live that's, the Club that's first. fine. That's fine. It's Spot Spotify is more likely to be wrong than um. Yeah, because they might upload it later. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, uh, and we'll find out what the what the secret album is when when we get to it. Yes, nothing super surprising in a sense, unless tricks something tricks pick something out of left field, which I would love to see. But yeah, it's a uh, radio has TKOL remix one two three four five six seven, and the remix eight single and Jaded Hearts Club alive at the one hundred club two clubs in that title. I don't know if I like that. And you have picked Yard Acts. Where is my Utopia? Yep. That's going to do it for Distant Ways. My name is Dominic. You can see all my stuff below in the in the show more option. I am on Same the Found Podcast, though. We just did an episode. I'm recording an episode in less than eight hours about Xenogears, so that's going to be a fun time. And I also have my stuff in the below, and I'm pissing off to a gig. Yes, have fun with that. Gig 94, let's go. And we will see you all later, and... We'll, all three of us will probably talk to you next time. So have a good time doing what you're doing. Bye-bye.